This video was made possible in part by Audible. Get your first audiobook completely for free by clicking the link below. Russian weapons exports are collapsing. And it's not just killing Russia's profits, it's also eroding what's left of Russia's grip on global power. In 2011, Russian arms exports were booming, with total sales amounting to over 8 billion US dollars per year. But today, Russian arms exports have disintegrated by nearly two-thirds to less than $3 billion per year. And this descent shows no signs of stopping, as Russia's global position in the arms trade has just been taken over by somebody, surprising, who has managed to steal Russia's weapons business from some of its closest allies, in the middle of an ongoing war. And what's left of the Russian arms trade now seems to be spiraling downwards faster than Yevgeny Prigozhin's airplane. All joking aside, this is becoming a serious problem for Russia. But if they had managed themselves well, this never should have happened. Not long ago, Russia was the world's second largest weapons exporter. Aside from major competitors like the United States, their reputation in the global arms industry was almost unparalleled, and they had carved out their own seemingly untouchable niche. There's no doubt that you've probably heard of many classic Russian weapon systems. Russian helicopters, SAMs, and AK-47s, just to name a few, are very recognizable, having made appearances in a huge number of 20th and 21st century conflicts, for good reason. Russian arms have never been seen as the best on the market, but they have long been seen for many as close enough to the best, being extremely reliable, easy to repair, and very low cost. During the Cold War, Russia worked very hard to develop this niche in the global arms trade, selling their low-cost gear to countries that were either unable or unwilling to buy Western gear, and they were very successful. In many parts of the world, Russia was able to achieve a practical monopoly on military spending. This became a revenue source for Russia, but it also served another, much more important purpose, becoming one of their most strategic sources of soft power. Through their weapons trade, they were able to influence and direct global affairs in a way that served their national interests. As other countries became dependent on Russia for their military supply and defense, it became difficult, and in many cases, practically impossible for these nations to take another side from Russia when it came to major global affairs. Using this strategy, the Soviet Union was able to build a large block of military influence in the world, one AK-47 at a time, which Russia still benefits from today. There's a lot more details on that than we're able to cover in this video, but you can learn more by reading the recommended companion book for today's episode, which you can also listen to on Audible, completely for free for new customers, by using the link below. Understanding that history will be interesting for you, but what's even more interesting is when you realize where it's brought us today, as Russia's soft power from the arms trade now seems to be coming to an end. And with it, one of the few sources of influence they had left over many of their fair-weather friends. Just another unintended consequence of their ill-planned invasion of Ukraine. Just this year, for example, some of Russia's closest allies made surprising moves away from Russian arms, signaling their loss of confidence in the nation as a military power. India, one of Russia's largest customers, has placed orders for 210 Western aircraft, more than two and a half times the 84 Russian aircraft they ordered in the same time period. And Serbia, long one of Russia's closest allies, and also a loyal customer, is also in talks to buy its own fleet of Western aircraft, having abandoned Russian alternatives after admitting their military needed to go in a different direction upon witnessing Russia's embarrassing retreat from Kherson. So who, you might ask, is the nation supplying these new aircraft to Russia's allies? Well, not who you might think. As I said, these are Western aircraft, so they're not being supplied by China, Brazil, South Africa, or anyone else in BRICS, the supposedly unbreakable alliance that stays loyal to each other and stands firm against NATO encroachment. Nope. When they want reliable aircraft, India and Serbia aren't going to BRICS. They're buying from France. Ironically, one of the same countries that's currently helping to equip Ukraine with gear for its fight against Russia. Official Russian state media, along with the Russian trolls in the comments section of my YouTube videos, will swear left and right that Russian military gear is superior to the West, that Russia is winning the war, that my videos showcasing Russia's failures are just propaganda, and that the rest of the world outside of the West knows this. 
But the actual hard data coming in the form of arms orders from Russia's closest allies tells a very different story. Because instead of buying Russian armaments, these allies are observing the war and instead choosing to place orders with the very same suppliers Russia is claiming superiority over. Let's be clear, these nations are perfectly willing to trade with Russia when it comes to taking advantage of their situation to secure major discounts on cheap oil, gas, and other resources that Russia can't get rid of due to international sanctions. They are just apparently not willing to extend the same trade to Russia when it comes to matters of their own national security. And in the areas that actually count for their survival, these nations appear to be drawing further away from Russian influence and closer to NATO. Russia, which used to be a respected nation selling reliable modern military equipment at a low cost, has now been reduced to a junkyard black market, one that may soon struggle to export even a single Molotov cocktail. So why the sudden shift in attitude towards Russian arms? There are several reasons, and we should be clear. Russia's arms industry has already been declining for over five years, long before the start of the most recent invasion of Ukraine. But recent moves by Russia's allies are major signals that this decline has been greatly escalated by factors associated with Russia's military failures over the past year or so, which is actually the opposite of what Russia was likely expecting and intending. From a sales perspective, the war in Ukraine should have been an opportunity for Russia to show off its new capabilities and win further business, and therefore further power, for decades to come. And if Russia's original plan to enter the country and overthrow it quickly had been successful, this may well have been the case. But instead, Russia experienced the worst possible PR campaign for its military equipment we could think of. Probably the worst the world has ever seen. Russian convoys became bottlenecked as trucks broke down during their Blitzkrieg invasion. Then, Russian tanks became famous for losing their heads. Russian aircraft crashed to the ground with no one firing at them. And Russian missiles boomeranged onto their own crews. A lot of this wasn't due to design flaws. Russian gear is generally pretty good, when it works properly. Instead, most of the issues arose due to corruption, incompetence, or both. And we've covered that at length in other videos. But whatever the cause, the reputational damage was real. And you can bet that every one of Russia's arms customers, whether or not they said it out loud, started to have second thoughts about the Russian gear they had sitting in their own warehouses, wondering if they had really gotten what they paid for. The reality is, when Western nations give Ukraine military hardware, and it defeats Russian hardware on the actual battlefield, and not just in spec sheets and Twitter threads, it makes a statement that the world cannot ignore. And in this way, for every piece of equipment the West sends to Ukraine, they are effectively growing their share of the arms export market, along with the profit and soft power that it brings, at the expense of the share currently held by Russia. That's equipment failure, but perhaps just as troublesome for Russia's customers is also equipment shortages, which have been extreme. Because even if Russian systems hadn't suffered from reputational damage, the war still brings the risk that other nations might not even be able to receive their weapons, even if they had still gone as far as being willing to place orders. The reasons for equipment shortages are obvious. Russia needs to use its military gear for its own purposes before it can supply excess gear to others. And there are the sanctions to consider, which hinder Russia's ability to import crucial supplies needed to manufacture arms and their ability to export arms beyond Russian borders. But even then, the shortages have been more extreme than expected. At times, Russia has had to pause or ration their artillery barrages, waiting for shells and ammunition to be delivered from North Korea. Running low on modern tanks, Russia has had to pull old Soviet-era gear out of storage to keep their troops in the fight. Russian soldiers have complained of being given insufficient and often expired rations. And there are many more examples like this, touching nearly every facet of the Russian military. So Russia's customers are rightly concerned that, if Russia can't even manage to equip their own troops, they will certainly not make it a priority to fulfill the orders coming in from other nations. And that's assuming Russia will even be around in the near future, which some of Russia's allies may no longer take for granted. Placing orders for military gear might make you look stronger on paper, but unless that gear has actually been delivered, it's not going to help you defend yourself if, say, China decides to penetrate your borders, which, in the case of India, is one of the things they're most concerned about. This concern for Russia's customers isn't something they're necessarily historically used to having to deal with. The Soviet Union, for all its flaws, was at least a production powerhouse. Not when it came to consumer goods, perhaps, 
but certainly when it came to military gear. And if they couldn't get the gear out in time, chances are that nobody could. At least not for the kinds of customers the Soviet Union was accustomed to selling to. So, while the Soviet Union was building up its original arms trade, and making many of the connections that Russia still relies on today, supply chain issues were either much less prevalent, or their customers simply had no better options, even if issues did pop up. But that's no longer the case today. Over the past several decades, many of Russia's customers have industrialized at a pace that has allowed them to leapfrog Russia's production capabilities, in particular, India and China, historically Russia's largest arms customers. Not only does that mean India and China don't have to rely on Russian arms anymore, it also means that Russia's historical customers can now buy from them instead of Putin. This is the trend that has already been eroding the Russian arms industry for the past several years, but with the war in Ukraine, that trend may have become permanent. All of the advantages that allowed the Soviet Union to build up the powerful Russian arms industry and grow their soft power have now been eroded, from the competency of the gear itself to the supply chains that allow them to deliver it dependably and at scale, to the basic assumptions about Russia's future existence as a country that would make long-term military dependencies possible. Ukraine is causing the Russian arms industry to crack at the seams. And perhaps Russia's customers are also weighing the dependability of their relationship with the bear. One final thing that Russia has proven in this war, in the realm of oil and gas, is that they are willing to cut off supply to backstab their largest customers and assert their geopolitical power. We made a whole video on that, and why that effort failed. And Russia's arms customers are probably asking themselves how vulnerable they would be if Russia decided to do the same to them, and cut off their supply of weapons to force them to submit to their will. Nobody likes a bully, and nobody feels safe relying on one for trade either. Hence, the growing market share of the West. The fact that India and Serbia are buying Western gear also destroys another talking point commonly repeated by Russian propagandists about the war, which is the idea that the threat of a NATO encirclement supposedly made Russia's invasion of Ukraine a necessity. For India and Serbia to be willing to purchase NATO military gear at such a time as this, they apparently find the threat of a future war with NATO to be far less realistic than the threat of a war where they will need NATO's support. When they actually need to make decisions for the future of their nations, Russia's own allies have observed Putin's major talking points, and found them to be severely wanting in terms of facts and reality. Still, all of this isn't to say Russia has no advantages in the arms industry. They have ships that are capable of instantly transforming into submarines, their tank turrets are capable of becoming temporary aircraft, and only Russia has boomerang missiles that turn around in mid-flight, implying that they may have advanced artificial intelligence that allows the missiles to identify who the real bad guy is. Scary stuff. To accompany each of our videos, we're introducing a new themed shirt with each episode. For today's episode, we've got a great one that's sure to start productive conversations about the Russian arms industry. Because these days, even the wiriest guy who's never visited a gym in his life still has more effective arms than what Russia has been putting out. You can get your copy and browse shirts from other episodes in the description or below this video. Let us know in the comments if you have an idea of your own, and we'll give you a shout out if we pick yours. And again, if you want the full story on how Russia built their intricate systems of soft power, which is very interesting. I highly recommend you listen to Arna Vestad's book on the history of the Cold War, which you can listen to on Audible completely for free by using the link in the description of this video.